Hi guys. Another day. Oops. Another day, another show. Currently pinning this tweet as I always do. And I struggle with it, but you know what? We're gonna figure it out. Pinning a tweet, don't mind me. Or not pinning a tweet, pinning an Instagram comment. Why does Facebook make it so hard? There we go. Hi guys. That's my song, Universal Healthcare, famously. Um, I'm your host, Z-Way, and this is my comedy show where I interview different guests about, you know, race relations in America. We have a fantastic show for you. Mind you, this is a comedy show for any international publications that want to pull quotes. Make sure you uh, add context. Now, this is a fantastic show today. We have Yasser Lester, brilliant comedian, and Alyssa Milano, a comedic actress. Um, yeah, it's going to be a fantastic time. Now, let's find our buddy Yasser. Oh, there he is. All right. Hi, guys. I'm so excited for the show. Hello. What's up? Um, I can see Yasser that you have an interesting an interesting um, sign behind you. Uh, I mean, that's just something that I always, I've always had that. I, li I like art, so I keep art up around the apartment, you know, just so people when they come, they have something nice to look at. So that's the that's the piece I had. You know, sex trafficking is no laughing matter, Yasser. Mm -hmm, I, it's not. I was terrified of this interview because I find you to be one of the funniest people I know who um, will ultimately get me in trouble for this. <laughs> I'm gonna get you in trouble? Yeah. Okay, nice try. We'll see. If, if either one of us come out of this with a career, we've both failed. Oh my goodness. Now, Yasser, you famously date a white woman. So my first question <laughs> <person, laughs> Famously. Famously date a white woman. My uh -huh. first question for you uh -huh. is, um, do you believe that black women are not worth love? <laughs> you know, uh, this is, you know, and truly, this is something I think about all the time. I'm like, do black women deserve love? And I absolutely think they do. I'll say this, my girlfriend now, half white, I think it's very important. <laughs> Though I know white presenting, but uh, it's just who I, it's just who I'm dating, you know? And like, I've dated everybody. Date black girls, date everybody, but- You've um, dated black girls before? And what was that experience like, Yasser? I'll say this, the same as dating anybody else, except, you know, there's a, what's it called? There's a shorthand, you know, involved when you date someone of your own culture and background, but uh, other than that, you know, it's pretty much it's, uh, it's the same. You scream, you fight, you eat, you hang out, you do all the same things. I don't love hearing that you scream at black women. Now, Yasser, what does black love mean? <laughs> Sorry, what was your question? What does black love mean to you, Yasser Lester? Uh, here's the thing. Black love is... It's more than just, you know, it's more than just the traditional sense of the word. It's, it is a mutual understanding of each other's like struggle and victory, I would say. It's not just, it's not just the simple, like, I think a lot of people, you know, I think it's like a lot of incense and like scented candles and like real bad memes where it's like a man, it's like a cartoon of a man protecting his woman, but there's like knives being thrown into his back. And it's just like, if you ain't doing this, then you ain't doing nothing. <laughs> but like, but I do think in its simplest form, is it's, it's not just a love and appreciation of your partner, but it's a love and appreciation of the shared culture and experiences that you have. Great, so just knowing that you're not involved with black people. <laughs> where do you stand on the subjugation, y'all, Sir Lester? What do I stand on? Why I'm sorry. Imagination. Oh, here's the thing. Like I personally love it. Can't get enough of it. Clearly. <sighs> do you do race play? By the way. <laughs> <laughs> look, here's the thing. There, look, it, anyone can. Anyone's kinks and fetishes are are what they are. There are certain things that it's just like. Just as, a, like, what are we doing? You know what I mean? And I feel like that's a, like, what are we doing? You know? So, no, sorry. <laughs> um, how many Black friends do you have, Yasser? Um, 
the question should be the opposite. I think it should be how many friends of other do I have? Because like my friends and family are black, and then it's like I have Indian Akash, Persian Reza, Jewish though Nick Cannon hates it, Robbie Slowick, um, and then the rest of my homies are just black people, black not just like, black men, women, non-binary, everyone. You're friends with everyone. Um, mm-hmm. So could you name five white people off the top of your head? Can I name five white people? OK. Uh, Wes Anderson, Leslie Nielsen, Steve Kerr, Sean King, and <laughs> Rachel Dolezal. <laughs> <laughs> Tough. <laughs> Honestly, fair. Um, could you and um, OK, so famously, you go on Danielle well, Danielle Schneider and Casey Wilson's podcast, Bitch Sesh. And every single time you go on this podcast, you have they have to apologize <laughs> for the things that you say. So my yeah. first question is, um, is making these white women apologize for you your form of reparations? Here's a little bit, yes. And it's not, it's not them specifically, but I do feel like we're at a time in history. Black people should do and say whatever they want at all times with no repercussions. And then y'all sort it out. Like, it's not on us anymore. Like, I'm not going to be the tap dude who's just like, oh, I, I apologize for the, and it's just like, I don't feel like, I feel bad for if anyone thinks I'm specifically coming at like their family. That's what I feel bad for. But like the general, like, I've had the bitch sesh fans come after me and call me a racist against white people. And a little bit, it's like, yes, like I'm the thing Terry Crews is talking about. Like, I'm not just saying Black Lives Matter. I am saying Black Lives Better. Like, I'm wow. a Black supremacist. <laughs> well, because you famously said um, gingers have no souls. Okay. A- out of context, I said that the belief is that gingers have no souls. What I said specifically is I said that ginger kids with attitudes need to watch it because when they grow up, they're going to start getting treated like black people by other white people. That's what I said. And I I hold that to be true because white people dunk on gingers constantly. Like they truly act like as if they are not their own flesh and blood. So that's what I was saying. I was just like, yo, like ginger kids, like y'all need to chill because when y'all get out here in the world, like they're not, it's not going to be sweet for you. Okay. And you also described um, a housewife who has black children as, um, tragically mixed who look like two homeless street kids from Venice. How do you buy that? Okay. Here's, because again, I got cut off. I did say they were tragically mixed. And then I went on to say like Blake Griffin. What I was trying to say before I got cut off was that they didn't take any of the color. That's what I was trying to say. And also the homeless thing, I should have used surfer as instead of homeless. Homeless is a funnier word than surfer, but there are a lot of mixed kids out in Venice surfing who also a lot of them are homeless now again (laughs) but again I did I wasn't like coming at the it was truly just like a oh they're like mad mad light skin as someone who is mixed and light skin and I'm not even saying this is someone to be like oh well like I should be able to say it but I will say it was an observation that was not, I, it wasn't completely, you know, it wasn't as articulate or articulated as it could be. And now here we are. And, you know, now, now you're going to have to apologize for me because I'm going to, next time I talk about them, I'm going to say, just like Z Way says, and then I'm going to go into my rant. Oh my goodness. Now, Yasu, you identify as light skin. On um, another round a year ago, you said that dark skin dudes are muscular and can show up in t shirts to events. Yes. Why would you say that? Because I, my theory is that light plays better off darker skin, so there's more muscle definition. But, like, the lighter you get, that's why white dudes don't look as muscular as black people. Like, no matter how buff they are, because, like, the light doesn't show enough definition. And light-skinned dudes, we don't have as much color, so it doesn't look as good. Like, every, the, the best you can look as a muscular light-skinned dude is, like, Drake. Like, it's, like, big, but it ain't, like, maybe Boris Kojo. Have you ever worn colored contacts before? 
I I mean this sincerely. That is a very light skinned question, and I never have. Like, but see, the fact that you ask me means that you know light skinned dudes are a problem. I don't. I don't discriminate. Um, I will. I support people of all colors. Um, now here's a question for you. Um, oh, you described yourself as the wokest male intersectional feminist of all time. Yeah. <laughs> how how do you just, how do you um, exemplify that in your day to day life? This is, I truly, now, it was, I'm taking a little bit out of context, but I'll also say that, like, so much of being an intersectional male feminist or anything is just recognizing the humanity of people. Like, I don't know, I don't know any Sri Lankans, but I know that they're human beings, and I will treat them as such. And, like, this idea that we all, like, this idea that it's so hard to to recognize the differences in one say another totally like is innocent yeah that, oh sorry that's <laughs> another piece of art that i have i just like art uh so but, but i say all that to say that like you know all these people being like i'm doing the reading and blah blah, blah. and it's just like yes but also like if you recognize the humanity in anyone you will want to fight for them because you see yourself in that person knowing that your struggles are different and knowing that your your circumstances are different shouldn't matter you should recognize that they are different and in that you should want to help them knowing that things are a problem for them would you um can, would you um agree to paying every sri lankan in the comment section money since you're rich and reparations? <laughs> <laughs> look uh, if, if any sri lankans show up in here hit me up it literally hit my instagram and i'll i'll see what i can do I don't know what the conversion rate is. Oh, yeah, you have to be in Sri Lanka. You can't be getting American and be here because I'll, I'll oh go my broke. Goodness. Yeah. Um. Wow. Okay. So Yasa, you were a you were a black writer on the TV HBO's TV show Girls. Yes. Were you responsible for the black boyfriend storyline? Uh, was that with Donald Glover? Mm -hmm. No, I was not. I wasn't on the show yet. I didn't come till seasons four and five or five and six. Sorry. Okay, interesting. Cool. I actually yeah. didn't know you were um, a writer on that show, so I find that yeah. very nice. And yeah. so you're, I would consider you a very successful actor, writer, producer. Um, you're actually really flashy with like the clothes that you wear. You rock a lot of designer. You have maybe four or five gold chains on this yeah. very moment. Now, yeah. my question for you is, are you a class trader? <laughs> Am I a class trader? Um, I, I think a little bit everyone kind of is who reaches a certain level of success because at the end of the day like and i mean it sincerely i was homeless 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 growing up i was homeless when i got to la slept in my car i've done all of it like I, there was full months where all i ate were tortilla chips for breakfast lunch and dinner because i was stealing them from the job that i had um and to say that like i would be willing to give that all up is a little or to give all of this up which isn't a lot, but like to to ensure everyone is okay, I don't know if I would. And I know that's bad, I know it's bad, but I also don't think everyone deserves not to struggle. They're like, I, you think that not everyone is good. And so for me to be like, oh yeah, that person who, you know, called me a nigger in seventh grade also deserves the same things I have is a lie and I do not. <laughs> And I will not <laughs> allow them to relish in my successes. Wow. <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, <laughs> you got in trouble for um, a fake tweet about Jersey Mike's where you uh -huh. said that they changed the, um, their BLT to bacon, lettuce, and tomato. What yes. about Black Lives Matter is funny to you? Uh, nothing about Black Lives Matter is funny to me. And I'll say that, as a matter of fact, I did it more as a call out to corporations, as a call out to white liberals who are oh. so easily falling into these traps of being like, I'll post a black square, I'll do that. They'll, they're always looking for the easy way out. And so all these companies came out and said, like, we're going to do what it takes and we're going to do this. And no one did anything. And more so, and even scarier, is the fact that something so ridiculous could take off because people believed it. It means that we are in such a bad way with these companies and corporations and with faux liberalism that people were like, oh yeah, there's th this has to be real. That's scary. I would say two years ago, if you posted something like that, people would automatically go, this is a joke, right? 
But now we live in such an era of everyone racing to be, again, the faux wokest that something like that doesn't even register as humor anymore. Okay, two years ago, you said that um, it was easier to talk about Cecil the Lion. It was easier to talk about Cecil the Lion versus Black Lives Matter. Do you think that's still the case? It was easier for white people to talk about it. Do you think that's still the case? Yes, absolutely. Damn. Because I, I like, here's the thing, because as a country, everyone agrees that killing a lion for no reason is bad, right? Everyone from coast to coast, you know, you got people in Oklahoma bawling their eyes out for an, an African lion that they've never met. But if you mention Tamir Rice, if you mention Trayvon Martin, if you mention Rakia Boyd, all these kids, there's still a level of what did they do? Mm. And so that in and of itself proves that it, it's much harder to have those conversations because they don't recognize the humanity of the animal. I agree with you that. On, on that. Um, so last question is, why did yeah. you decide to come on to the show? Um, you are my friend, and I think you're hilarious, and I love the show, and I think so much of what the public perception of what people are is so, like, uh, so sanitized. And, like, here's the thing. Realistically, I get in trouble for things that I say all the time, and, yeah. like, I would, rather, I would rather it be with you and, you know, at least... <laughs> At least it's a, it's a black hand nailing my vinyl hand to the cross <laughs> than a bunch of, you know, a uh, bunch of weird Rick and Morty nerds. Okay, wow. Well, that's Yasser Lester, everyone. Please go follow this hilarious, hilarious man. <laughs> Bye, Yasser. Bye. Yasser is one of the funniest, most problematic people I know. On Black Monday, on Duncanville, those Black Monday is one of the funniest scripted comedies on the air, so check that out. I think it just hit its episode 10, so all the episodes for the season are out. Now we have another fantastic guest, Alyssa Milano. Let's see if we can find this lovely lady. All right. Okie dokes. We, we are going to reach out to our producers who are listening to these airwaves. We are going to help wrangle talent. If anyone, my producers particularly, could help me wrangle um, Alyssa Milano, that would be fantastic, as I have a lot of questions. <laughs> Where could Alyssa be? Guys, I watched um I watched Who's the Boss this week. That show is hilarious. <laughs> Tony Danza. Amazing. Oh, we have a producer. Hmm. Okay. No, that's not Alyssa. She's in the chat. I cannot ooh, let's see if I can Milano. Can she request me? Because I am in the chat and I am looking for this fantastic talent. Or, and hey, she's here. I can see that you guys say she's here, but I need to get a request as I search for her. This is so exciting. I'm so excited. Alyssa Milano is one of the best comedic actresses out there. We stand the boss. You just have to watch, yeah. Okay, I'm doing what I can. And you know what, as a black woman, it is up to y'all to support me emotionally, physically, as I do labor for you. To give you the content that you please. She is here. I see you guys saying she's here, but again, I am searching. M-I-L. So that's not it. I've searched Milano and I've searched Alyssa. You know, unfortunately, this is not live to tape, so we're not able to edit this. I know what her handle is. <laughs> huh. I know. Oh, oh, guys, don't worry. I know. Is it possible that she could um, exit and re-enter? Because I am. I typed Melissa and I've typed or Alyssa and I've typed Milano. Let's see. Facebook Live is such an interesting device. One day they'll write books about our experiences in the quarantine. And you know what? Okay. Hey. Alyssa, also feel free to maybe comment. Maybe I can request you that way. We're going to make it work because I am a woman in STEM. And I support science. Oh, I found her! Wow. You know, God is good. Shout out. Shout out, JC. 
Oh my goodness. Thank you, producers. Hello! Hi, we did it. This we is the first it. time I've ever gone live. Oh my gosh, what an honor to be to go live with you. A brilliant Hi. comedic actress with amazing comedic timing. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm okay. How are you doing? I'm doing I mean, well. you know, the the world is a little crazy right now, but um I'm trying to do the best I can. I've got two kids that are uh eight and and five. My my son is eight, my daughter is five, and um, it's been, it's been a, it's been a struggle. It's hard. Don't oh, miss my parents. Yeah. You know, how are you doing? I'm doing, I'm not well. <laughs> yeah. I'm alive and I, I have a roof over my head so I can't complain. Yeah. It's, isn't it like a roller coaster? Some days I'm totally fine and I'm able to like really appreciate that I'm with my family. Um, and I have this time with my kids. And then like two days ago, I was a complete maniac. I was so I had such um, rage, like total rage, that everything that my kids did upset me everything that my husband said upset me. Uh, I was crying in my bed and, you know, and I couldn't, I spoke to my therapist and I couldn't figure out, I was like, what, like, what's different about today? Totally. And I don't think that there was anything really specifically different, except that, I, you know, that whole thing with the CDC happened where he was, yeah. where he's now trying to get information directly from hospitals instead of going through the CDC. And I was like, what are we doing? And then I started getting pissed at the Democrats because I was like, where are they right now? So I don't know. So I had a little meltdown two days ago and I woke up fine yesterday. Also, I mean, I'm drinking more than normal. I'm eating a lot of carbs. <laughs> yeah, you know, God gummies. Was yeah it's it's honestly a hard time and i what i actually find to be, give me reprieve is having good friends in my life so just to start off this interview how many black friends do you have um i knew you were gonna ask that question and as i was sitting um trying to think about it i realized um that i i'm able to quantify my white friends more than black friends because um, I don't have a lot of white friends. Most of my friends are people of color. They're not all black, but like my bestie in the whole world that I've been best friends with for 25 years is um, Palestinian. Um, and my longest friendship in my life is uh, this amazing man named Jamie Jazz, who was my producer when I was a kid. I had albums that I released and he was my producer and it, it it was 19, like 88, which makes me super old. But I remember very distinctly having this conversation with him about, um, I was on Who's the Boss already and I had a Mercedes that I had bought myself. And one day we were in the recording studio and this is before Rodney King. I mean, this is, this is the eighties. And I, I said to him, I said, let's go to lunch. Do you want to drive? You know, just thinking like, I don't want to drive. And he was like, no, I can't drive your car. And I said, what do you, what do you mean you can't drive my car? And he goes, well, honey, I'm, I'm black. I can't drive a Mercedes. And that was literally my first experience with the police treating black people um, in a way that was not equal. And uh, I thought about it the other day, um, you know, when, well, not the other day now, all the days are ble bleeding into one, but when the protests started happening, I called him and I said, you know, this is, this has been good. I want to remind you of this moment when you told me that you couldn't drive my Mercedes because if a black guy was driving my Mercedes, a cop would pull us over and, and, and probably be arrested for you know, nothing. So um, the white, I can tell you that outside of my um, husband, who is white, my parents who are white, my kids who are white, um, and my therapist is white. Your therapist <laughs> is white. 
<laughs> yeah. So, so those are, those are, um, those are the people in my life that are white and the rest are different ethnicities. And I think, um, I, I think I have a real distinct reason for that. Um, so in, uh, in 2000, so 20 years ago, I lived in South Africa for three months and I volunteered in a township and a children's hospital. And it was nine years after apartheid was abolished. So it was, the country was really changing and shifting. And I could not believe the dichotomy of how the country was so incredibly beautiful when you looked up at the mountains and then so totally tragic when you were at eye level. And I got really caught up in the um, philanthropic humanitarian, uh, what was going on there because it was in such flux. And when I got home from South Africa, I started, I started really, um, I started really being angry at my white friends because I felt like they didn't understand how um, how black people live and the oppression throughout history. So for the last 20 years, I've kind of focused my life a little bit more on um, making friends with people of color because um, Quite frankly, they've been the most honest. Black people are honest. I would agree with that expression. Let's go through a couple of uh, black civil rights leaders because you mentioned apartheid and I'm glad to hear that you know you are against that. Now, do you know who Martin Luther King is? Martin Luther King Jr.? Sure. Yes, of course. Who is he? Just one sentence, who is he? Civil rights leader. Great, and what about Malcolm X? Malcolm X, also a civil rights leader, but happened later on. Um, uh, I just actually wound up watching on Netflix Who Killed Malcolm X, which I highly recommend, um, because I didn't realize that that case is still open. Well, they're considering reopening that case. Marcus Garvey. I don't know who that is. Philip Asa Randolph. I don't know who that is. Huey Newton. I don't know who that is. Stokely Carmichael. I don't know who that is. Fred Hampton. I don't know who that is. Okay, Angela Davis. I know who a Angela Davis is. All right, one sentence on Angela. Uh, she was an abolitionist. Rosa Parks. Yes. She was actually um, not the first woman, black woman, who put up a fight about sitting in the back of the bus, but she was the one that, that was uh, famous for that, that moment in time and changed history. Totally. What about Tarana Burke? <laughs> She's my mentor. Let's elaborate on that. So I met Tarana when, um, when, okay, so Harvey Weinstein, sorry, my nose is running. Um, so when all the Harvey Weinstein chaos was happening, I was, I was at a loss because I, um, I worked for Harvey on Project Runway All-Stars and also was very good friends with his wife. So like many other situations, uh, I was confused. It was like really complicated for me. So um, I, didn't, I didn't comment right away because I was trying to be mindful and didn't want to be hurtful. And my friend, uh, Charlotte Clymer, uh, who is a, an amazing woman, uh, sent me in the midst of everything this DM that's, that had the screen grab of what was floating around on Facebook, which basically was, is the same screen grab I put in my original tweet, 
which said, you know, something to the effect of, you don't have to say who, but if you've been sexually assaulted, harassed, or abused, um, just write me too. And so I was like, you know what, I'm just gonna put this up there and see what happens. No idea who Tarana Burke is at this time, no idea about her Me Too movement, anything. So I press send and I go to sleep. And the next morning, there were 30,000 replies and it was trending number one. And it was really overwhelming for me. Um, about 48 hours later, I would say, I got a call from my publicist saying, did you know that there was already a, a Me Too movement? And I said, I had no idea. Please send me all the information. So my publicist wrangled information and it, like we, you know, she looked at the, on the internet. I followed Tarana because at this time, um, uh, black activists were accusing me of co-opting Tarana's movement. So I, I uh, DM'd her and I said, I would love to talk to you on the phone. Let's chat. And, um, and that is how I met Tarana. And I have to tell you, I promised her on the phone that day. I said, any opportunity I have to speak about this movement, I will include you. Whether that means Good Morning America interviews, people, met, whatever it is, I will include you. Um, but beyond that, uh, she, I was so fucking relieved to have met her and found her because I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. I still don't really know what I'm doing, right? Like I'm a person that has a platform that cares a lot, that leads hopefully from a place of service and love. Um, uh, and when I sent the Me Too tweet, it felt like I was, I was, I was being given everyone's secrets to keep safe. And I hadn't dealt with my own sexual assault yet, which I had, there were two in my life. And so I was being triggered at the same time. So to be able to find Tarana and know that um, she had been in this space for so long and that I didn't have to try to lead this movement and that she there is no one better um uh was really a great relief and you know she has been the the one person that I can look at in this space that doesn't feel like um they're they're uh, they disapprove of how I do things. She just, like, when she does disapprove, she'll call me and be like, you know what, that wasn't the best way to handle this. And this is where we are. Like, this is where the movement is. Um, because otherwise, I don't know, like, I don't live, I don't live in the, in the, in this, in this space of activism. I, mm. I live as a as an actress, that's been very fortunate to have a platform. You know? I totally, I, I really appreciate that you use your platform for good. Now, speaking of platform, recently, Rose McGowan was on this show. Mm -hmm. And she accused you of wearing, I, well, I don't want to promote white on white crime, but she accused you of wearing blackface for 4th of July weekend. So I wanted to know, have you ever worn blackface before? I've never worn blackface. I did a parody of, she doesn't like me much, so let me just say that, but I did do a parody of Jersey Shore um, on Funny or Die, where I played, I came in like this, light-skinned, and then makeup transformed me into Snooki. And my take was a, um, how I felt that they, that show was representing Italian-Americans and so there are pictures all over me of, of me all over the internet in tan face um, oh, and okay. tan face. 
And uh, that's what people are saying, you know, that I did blackface. Um, there are a lot of people that have done blackface though, you know, and I don't know that um, uh, in hindsight that like maybe making fun of Snooki's tan wasn't the greatest move, especially with the internet. But I did feel like at that time I was I was making a political statement about like um, how Italian Americans are depicted. Totally. You know? would, you, would you consider Italians the Negroes of the white community? Would I consider Italians? I don't I don't know how to answer that except I'm gonna say that when I was in South Africa, um, people. South African black people kept telling me that I was from slave descent. And I said, I don't understand, like, how, how do you know that? And they said, because your last name is Milano. So you were actually bought into a city and instead of giving you or allowing you to keep your last name, they gave you the last name of the city you were bought into. So I don't know. I haven't done any of those genetic things, so I'm not I'm not sure like what the truth is to that. Um, but you said you were. I've listened to your podcast. Sorry, not sorry. You said that you were reading New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. So I was curious, who are your favorite black authors? Um, I love Alice Walker. Color Purple is one of my favorite books. Um, one of my favorite poem, uh, poets is um, Langston Hughes. Um, I think, uh, I think, you know, there are so many amazing black uh, singers and songwriters that are some of the best writers of our generation. Mm. I uh, like that you're musical, actually. So you, you said that um, J Jazzy J, what was this, Jimmy Jazz? Jamie Jazz. Jimmy Jazz helps you make music. And so what, what do you like rap music? What's your favorite rap song right now on the radio? Um, I don't really have time to listen to m music. Um, I like, I mean, I can tell you I like Drake a lot. Oh, yeah. What's your favorite Drake song? I like Beyonce a lot. Um. <laughs> What's your favorite Beyonce song? Um, who rose well, girls? Who my, my daughter and I dance around and have dance parties. Sorry my nose is running. I'm having no, like weird allergies little, in this room. You're great. And I love you impersonating black women. I think it's hilarious. Now, can you name five black women off the top of your head? Yes. Please. Um, you ready? Yes. <laughs> Alfre Witter. OK. I don't know why that name popped into my head, but it did. Um, Kamala Harris. Um, uh, well, we just talked about Toronto Burke. Um, uh, da, 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 da. I'm like on the spot. Pat Spearman, who is one of my, another one of my mentors, who's this, um, do you know who that is? No. She's this awesome senator from Nevada. And she's a veteran, and she was, um, she's was the she is the first black lesbian ever to be elected into office in Nevada. So she's amazing. Nice. Also, one of my mentors. Um, you have a lot of black mentors. I do because they're honest. Black women are honest. I would say that. What do you like it, qualitatively about black the black community? I don't know what that means. What qualities do you like about the black community? Um, so I think my, the thing that I appreciate the most, there's two things actually. One is the, um, the responsibility to family and community. Um, but also the way in which death is sort of handled in a very, um, personal uh, uh, also family way, how, you know, like in South Africa, someone, someone dies, someone passes away and 
their their pastor is there or their priest is there and walking families through every single step of losing somebody um and so i think that that i think you know all of those things we can certainly learn from and totally experience I, what i really i'm obsessed with your your um passion about south africa um it seems like that that, that place really had a long-standing impact on your life now if we could just switch topics a little Recently, well, not so recently, but you once tweeted, quote, I'm trans, I'm a person of color, I'm an immigrant, I'm a lesbian, I'm a gay man, I'm disabled. Alyssa, why, why did you tweet that? Yeah, I got, I got canceled for that. Um, wasn't the first time or the last. Um, because I was trying to shut a troll up who was uh, accusing me of um being a horrible person and not um believing in their same sort of trumpism philosophy so my reasoning for tweeting that was was almost like a the philosophy of you know people that uh you know the the sufi poets or um uh, poets through throughout the years or Gandhi saying that we're all connected. Um, I think you have to be able to um, at least feel and empathize with people that you don't have their lived experience in order to be able to want to fight for equality. Alyssa, would you consider yourself, this is, and this is something that you, you, people refer to in the public sphere, but would you consider yourself a sort of poster child for white feminism? I mean, that's how, how I've been labeled, for sure. I, again, I don't, I don't come at my activism from any place other than um, uh, trying to be a force of good and love and to lead in service, um, you know, and I think that um, what winds up happening is, especially right now with the election coming up, I think even people um, who had maybe a different uh, presidential pick that that I did, every little thing is going to be under the the microscope and and used as a weapon, really to discredit um, my opinion. And really all I'm trying to do, I'm not, try, I'm not saying that, um, uh, I'm just trying to educate and raise awareness so that people can then make their own choices and decisions. I mean, I come, do you know how I became an activist? No. Okay, so um, I'm probably quite a bit older than you. How old are you? I'm 19, Goo Goo Gaga. What does that mean? 19, Goo Goo Gaga. <laughs> that's how old I identify as. Oh, that's how old you identify as. I too <laughs> identify as 19. But um, so, so I was on a TV show called Who's the Boss when I was super, super little. I was 11 to 19. So it was a big chunk of my childhood. And um, I never really felt like I deserved to be successful at that young age. It didn't make sense to me. Um, I didn't have the kind of parents that um, were excited about the fact that I was on television. It felt to me like, um, like I was sort of fucking with their life so, because they had lives, right? They weren't living vic vicariously through me, which was good. But it never made sense to me. Anyway, when I was 15 years old, and it was hard because like everything that I was going through physically, like it's hard enough to go through puberty, let alone in front of millions of people, right? Yeah. So like I would, I started developing and like the two weeks later, there was a script called Sam's First Bra when I was 11 years old. And I was like mortified. I was totally mortified. And so I didn't, I wasn't comfortable in it. And then, but what um, does the activism part start? I'm telling you. 
So, uh, because it, there is a there is a full circle. So I get this call one day from Elton John, which just gives you a little idea of how absurd my life was. Um, and he said, uh, I've got a friend, his name is Ryan White, and you are his idol, would you meet with him? And do you know who Ryan White is or was? Okay, Ryan White um, was uh, HIV positive from a blood transfusion in the 80s. Um, hi, baby, you could come in. Oh I'm my gosh, hi. What did I steal? I'm doing an interview, baby. What did you do? So I could put the lights up. Hold on a sec. So cool. Baby, I'm doing an interview and I'm gonna give them all back. You could have all of your all of your notebooks. Can you hear? Her? She's upset because I propped up things on my note on with her oh, notebooks. No. Oh you're reading notes? Here. Show no, no, notes. her her notebook. <laughs> I propped up my lights with her notebook. Here are... <laughs> this has been such a wild interview. What an experience. Has it? Okay, so listen. Uh, Bella, do you want to come sit next to me? So, so he was HIV positive. He was 15 years old. He got it from a blood transfusion. He was just like... Um, this really strong kid. In the, in the 80s, there was a lot of stigma around um, being oh, HIV positive. Yeah, it was, little... honey, I'm live doing an interview. Hold, no, please. This is, this is mine. My okay, you can have that. Hold on. You're right there. This is so awesome. I love okay. it. No, this is so funny to me. Hey, Dave. <laughs> Dave. Bella, I'm live doing an interview. Holy shit. She, she, she definitely has my spunk. Let me what just put it that mean? way. No, that was perfect. Again. Perfect comedic timing. Yeah. It's, it's natural, truly. So wait, I'm gonna go shut the, thank you, Dave. My husband is downstairs. Um, so, okay, so, um, so yeah, activism. Kicked, yeah, so he was kicked out of school. Ryan White was kicked out of school because he was HIV positive because during the 80s, there was so much stigma. And of course the government fed into that and, and gave us all sorts of um, crazy uh, explanations t as to not only why HIV AIDS was a thing, but also how you contact or how you contracted it. So, um, so he fought, so they kicked him out of school because um, they were afraid that he was going to give HIV AIDS to other children. And so he fought for his rights to go back to school. He spoke in front of Congress and I was his idol. So I met with this beautiful 15 year old boy who is HIV positive. And he and I became really good friends. And through our friendship, he was getting sicker. And he said to me, he said to me, will you go on television and kiss me to prove that you cannot get HIV AIDS from casual contact? And so at 15 years old, at the height of my, you know, celebrityism, because I was never as famous as I was then, I went on the Phil Donahue show. That's how long ago this was. Wow. And I kissed him. And that moment changed my life because I fucking realized like, oh, this is, this is why, right? Like this is why I've been given this gift. This is what gives it purpose and meaning. And, um, and so it was that it was it was that moment when I was 15. And then, um, you know, a lot a lot of things like that. And then in 2000, um, not only did I live in South Africa, but I also um, got very caught up politically in what was happening and the fact that Al Gore had the election stolen from him. So that's when I sort of became an active participant in, you know, the civic responsibility of, and I used to um, drive people to the polls. I actually still do it when I can. Um, well, I think that that is, 
that story is remarkable. Um, I actually remember reading about that story, but I never connected that you um, were the young girl who did that. So that's really interesting to me. Now, yeah. as far as your activism is concerned, how do you commit towards um, reparations? Um, and will you be giving my viewers reparations in the comments? <laughs> how do I give them reparations in the comments? I don't know. If they drop their Venmo, you could maybe send them some cash. Sure, I'll do it. We'll hold you to that. Now, <laughs> last question for you. Wait, uh, that's it? Well, no, we can keep going. Hey, we can keep going. I was going to watch Real Housewives, but you're much more interesting than Ramona. <laughs> um, so wait, you once called for a nationwide sex strike in protest of the heartbeat bill, pro-life legislation in Georgia and Alabama. How's your sex strike going? You have two children, famously. Um, I, I've, I've crossed the picket line quite a few times uh, since then. Um, uh, my husband was, was very perplexed by that whole thing. But I will tell you this. In a time when we were starting to get all of these abortion bans that were popping up all over the country, um, it was very hard to get uh, mainstream media to cover it. They sure did cover the sex strike. So I think ultimately, even though everyone thought I was a crazy person, uh, which I sort of am, uh, I think ultimately it, it got people talking about it, you know? And I think, see, the thing that people, that I really want people to understand about my activism is like, I don't have insider information to how um, organizations are dealing with certain issues, right? So that kind of means I'm, I'm a one man show. I kind of, I don't answer to anybody and I sort of see what the problem is and I go for it. Um, sometimes that gets me in trouble um, because sometimes I'm not on the same like talking points that that these orgs are. For instance, I went on CNN and I was super honest about like, you know, I've had abortions um, and, you know, it was very hard for me and I felt like nobody actually wants to have an abortion. It is a very difficult decision um, that every woman I felt wrestles with. Well, I was canceled again for that um, because um, that that is not how um, the movement is framing abortion. The way the movement is framing abortion is that it is a very um, it is healthcare. It's a it's a common thing, and we need to be um, open to the idea that it you know that women control their destinies, mm. which I you totally want to get, but. Like, if I'm not included in giving me those talking points, like, I'm just going to go speak from my heart, right? Well, you can just find a book and then you just get the talking points from the book. Is that how people do it? Yeah. Wait, so like, what book would be the talking point of of abortion as like a, a something that we shouldn't feel is emotionally um, hard for women? And why do I, why do I have to, why do I have to change my own lived experience to be on talking point? Like maybe yeah. more, maybe women would relate to me and be like, you know what? Like, I, I get that. She made a tough decision. It was hard for her. You know what I mean? Like, isn't there room for all of it? Maybe? I don't know. Yeah, I think, I mean, if, like, if you, you're, well, everybody is welcome to speak without having done research or reading. That's, I support that. Hey, God bless. Now, earlier you- Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. No research or reading. I, ha I had the experience of abortion. Why do I have to research and read? You want to add theory to your ex lived experiences and that is the power of activism. But people aren't having me on for theory. They're having me on to talk about my own experience, right? Like- A hundred percent. And right? your experiences are so valuable. And then if you contextualize your experiences in like the greater American dialogue, then oh my God, suddenly it's like, wow, this is a really powerful activist. Right, but I, I'm not doing it to be a powerful activist, right? Like I do it, 
I do it because, um, you know, if I don't do it, I can't sleep with myself. Like I can't, I can't find purpose in, um, you know, owning two houses and all of the, the, the goodness that God has given me um, without feeling um, that I'm giving something back or being able to look. And the other thing is, I got to tell you, I get fucking annoyed when celebrities don't take a stand. Like, I don't I, just take a stand. You know, like, where are all the white men right now or during the Me Too movement that 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 came that came forward? You know, the, the male celebrities like George Clooney, who's always been super political, like, now all of a sudden we have Trump in office and that guy's not political anymore. Do you know what I mean? Like where, names. where is everybody? Wow. Alyssa, you are calling people out. And you know what? So what do you, I mean, so here's my point. My point is you either have the celebrities that don't take a stand hmm. or you have a celebrity that can speak from their own experience. Yeah. Um, and so, like, I, I try very hard to educate myself on issues to the best that I possibly can. But I, you know, I, this, this is me. This is, this is who I am, for better or for worse. And like I said, people, people have been trying to cancel me since the 80s, so. Okay, so we have two more questions for you. One question for, one question for you is, people have been canceling you since the 80s. What do you think about cancel culture? It, is someone where is it like, is it okay to cancel someone if they've committed a hate crime? Where does it end? Where does it begin? If they've committed a hate crime, of, sure, of course. Right. Okay, yeah. so that's a good place to take a stand. So, but the thing about cancel culture that I think is so interesting is like we're not really canceling these people, right? That's like, true. yeah, like. Like if if they had succeeded when they had su tried to cancel me and you know decades ago, I wouldn't still be here. Um, I think I think it's kind of become like a um, its own. It sort of has its own identity. What cancel culture is, right? Mm -hmm. Like it it kind of breathes its own life of um, it's something specific. Like you fucked up, and I'm gonna call you out on it which isn't really canceling someone, right? It's, it's giving people the opportunity to be able to see where you may have fucked up. I feel that. And last question for you, Alyssa, why did you agree to come on to this show? Hmm. Um, because I think part of, part of being an, a, a good ally is being uncomfortable. And I think these conversations, as uncomfortable as they might be, are important. And it's important that, um, that being in the public eye allows me to make mistakes that maybe other people can learn from and see in a way that is, um, to make a mistake and to grow from from evolution and grace and um and i just think you're cool oh thank you Alyssa. <laughs> i think i thank you so much for this interview you have been so open and vulnerable of and i just, i've learned so much about you and your activism so thank you um, thank you i would it's... love to have you again so i will reach out next please time. please Please, any any time, I would love I would love to come on again and um, and thank you for the opportunity and uh, maybe you could come on my podcast and we could trade. I would love to come on. Sorry, not sorry. Thank you. So consider it a day. Thank you, Alyssa. Bye. Thank everybody. you, darling. Bye, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Milana, the comedian, actress, icon. Um, what a fantastic show. Next week we have the fantastic Kimberly Drew as well as George Siveris. It's going to be a great show. 8 p.m. Eastern Thursday. See you guys on the other side. Bye.